Is Bitcoin getting an unfair bashing from the environmentalist and has massive money printing painted central banks into a corner? And what does this mean for stocks, bonds, cryptocurrencies, property, and precious metals? For answers to this, I have my guest this week on Goldcore TV, Dominic Frisbee, financial writer and author of, among other titles, Daylight Robbery and Bitcoin, the Future of Money. And remember, if you want to see more interviews with industry experts and thought leaders in financial markets, subscribe to Goldcore TV and hit the notification bell now. Dominic Frisbee, welcome to Goldcore TV. Thank you very much, Dave. Pleasure to be here. Now, we are seeing some interesting moves at the moment. Um, we're seeing stock markets, which you could argue have been in a bull market since about 2008. Uh, they've come off their highs a little bit recently. Uh, and wondering, do you think that this is something that is this a bit of a change of direction? Uh, for stock markets? Are they just taking a breather before they go a little bit higher? What do you think is actually going to influence stock markets going forward from here? Well, I suppose you've got to judge me on what my actions do and rather than what I'm saying, and I'm net long. So I guess that means I think they're going higher. Um, just from a, you know, it's quite art easy to articulate both a bull case and a bear case. The bull case is <laughs> extraordinary money printing mm. leads to higher higher asset prices, and that's pretty simple. Um, on the other hand, and and also, you know, it does seem that as we come out of COVID, uh, economies are recovering. It's you know, it's V-shaped. Economies are recovering pretty quickly and pretty rapidly, and just. You know, just looking around at my area and in comedy, which I work in, and so on, you know, it's almost like being switched straight back on. So, so it does seem that some kind, you know, and all the restaurants are full, and you can't get a a, a, a place in the pub, and so on. So, it does seem like, you know, the V shaped recovery thesis does carry some legs. Of course, what's going on in the real economy and what's going on in the stock market are not always the same thing. But anyway, that's the bullish case: V shaped recovery money printing um the bear case would have to be it's been going up for so long at some point it has to come down there aren't enough bears um there's too much leverage there's too much bullish sentiment we need a retracement um the inflation narrative is too set in people's minds at the moment and perhaps we just need a little reminder that deflation is possible um, and so on and so forth. But pretty much, you know, looking at the American S&P, every correction that we've had runs out of steam at the 50 or the 90 day moving average. Mm. Um, so that's bull market, basically. So I guess, you know, we're <laughs> it's been a bull market since 2009 when the S&P was 666. We're now above 4,000. We've had a, you know, we had the taper tantrum in, what was it, 2012, we had the COVID can tantrum, the Brexit tantrum, the, the COVID can tantrum last year. And these are short, sharp corrections in a in a what must can only be described as a secular bull market. And you have to give the bull market the benefit of the doubt because it's been right at you know, price go up. So so the bulls are the, the bulls are still clearly in control at this moment. I, I would say. Think. Yeah, it's going to take something to 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 switch that. Now you mentioned there you touched on the uh, taper tantrum that we've seen in the past, and we have had um, comments out of the Fed uh, in relation to potentially again tapering. Is there is there scope for them to actually really do that? Uh, I mean, I mean we're, we're, we've we've had massive money printing over the last decade and more, and in the last. 24 months, it's gone absolutely exponential. Have they actually got the scope to start tapering? Well, Wall Street is addicted to stimulus. Mm. And I think you have to look at it from the point of view of the person whose job it is to make these decisions. And then you have to look at what their ideology is and what the career risk is to them. Now, does any of these guys want to be the guy who put up rates and and brought the party to an end and brought a crash on and 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 uh even if it's in the name of of 
equality and it needs the correction and all the rest of it. Does anyone anyone want to be that watch or should they just carry on with rates at zero or half a percent or whatever it is and just let the party carry on and hopefully leave the crash to the person, the next person who gets the job? And I think the answer is that is it's just a much easier decision for a policymaker to make is just to let the whole thing carry on rather than be the person who with the pin who pops the bu- bubble on their watch. Nobody wants to be that person. It's not so kind of pol- really. policy. Policymakers are just becoming too political then, really, is it? Yeah. <laughs> we need a kind of... Clue we need a pol- in the, the clue is in the, the prefix poll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we need a Paul, we need a Paul Volcker type character who's willing to step in and, uh, and, and, and raise rates. But there's nobody of that... One, there's nobody of that ideology that's, that, that could do that. And B, we haven't had a... We haven't gone through the 1970s, so there isn't the sort of general will to accept a, a dose of the, that kind of medicine. So there's just the, that conversation isn't really being had at this moment in time because we're going from kind of taper tantrum to, to yield curve control and flip flop in between the flip flop in between the two. I mean, you know, if if the US uh, and again we're we're kind of focusing on the US, but I mean, if the US, US were to, to to raise rates, um, we're they're gonna they're gonna struggle with the amount of outstanding debt that there is at the moment. They can't allow bond yields to to go to go much higher than where they are without dramatically impacting um, stock markets. No, is the answer <laughs> short and simple. And then they're kind of caught between this um, caught between. Managing inflation on one hand and 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 creating more jobs on the other, and they've kind of pushed the managing inflation, and they've gone to this inflation average instead, which is basically kind of saying we're not going to let we're not going to worry about inflation in the short end, and you know expecting that it's going to be there, and then it arrives, and they start calling it kind of transitory. Yeah, so, I mean the, the 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 one thing that's different is that the 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 inflation does seem to be making its way into the real economy mm. in a way that it hasn't with previous bouts of money printing and that's partly because you know stimulus checks and furlough money and so on and so forth has been paid directly to people rather than going <laughs> to buy government bonds or wherever it's gone it's buying government bonds as well but it's it's making its way into the real economy and so like my missus is irish and she was describing to me that there's a real shortage of of uh, people working in shops in Ireland at the moment because everyone's getting their 350 euros a week furlough money why would yes. they go and work in a shop yeah. for 400 euros a week when they can you know get the 350 euros do a bit of moonlighting and um and live happily so that's you know that's inherently inflationary because it means wages have got to go up you know building all i'm keep reading all the all over the papers today there's a shortage of building supplies um again that's inflationary tin uh, copper all these you know massive shortages of all these essential materials that are that are essential to the real economy and you know prices going up so so it does seem like Inflation is a bit more present in everyday life uh, and not just in asset prices at the moment. Absolutely. And we're seeing that everywhere. You're seeing that here in Ireland. You're seeing it in the UK. You're seeing it in the the US. We can see uh, commodity prices on the rise, whether you're looking at things like whether it's wood or lumber, you know, that have basically gone up by a couple of hundred percent in the last couple of years, which is... Yeah, I mean, lumber's done even better than Bitcoin. Yeah. (laughs) But it's fundamental to uh, it's fundamental ingredient in building property. So yeah. you know the the price of property, the price to build property is is skyrocketing. You've got a shortage of property in certain countries, a, a shortage of property here in 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 Ireland, and you've got an increase in the cost of building and a shortage of uh, labour. And also, then we've had uh, we've had people furloughed in the property sector, closed down for the last year. So it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, them. another thing in in the UK is, I mean, I think seven hundred thousand people left London, but when COVID came, a lot of um, immigrant labour uh, went home. Immigrant labour keeps labour prices low. Yes, if there's no Im- immigrant labour, then the the the, la- uh, the, the cost of labour goes up, and again, that's inflationary. Yeah, the same thing's happening all over the place. Same thing happening here as well in 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 Ireland. A lot of the immigrant labour has gone back. 
um, has gone back home, um, and it's creating that it's creating that shortage. Um, and at a time when industry and uh, shops and restaurants and everything else are starting to open up again or attempting to open up again. Um, you touched there, you mentioned there about Bitcoin in comparison to how it's performed in relation to, 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 to lumber. Bitcoin has been the, the asset of choice for a lot of people over the last couple of years who have been trying to offset the effects of massive money printing. Um, now, in this week, uh, and within the last week anyway, we have seen a correction in the price of Bitcoin and in cryptos in general. And it crashed off from 64,000 the high down to touching off 30,000. It's rallied back up to about $40,000 now. But a lot of this has been fueled by two things, um, less so by tweets from Elon Musk. And as I always say, you know, people are trying to day trade Elon Musk's mood swings when it comes to Bitcoin. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Good luck. <doing> that. <laughs> yeah. But the second thing is um, China and uh, some changes that are happening in China with respect to banning transactions in Bitcoin that have happened on a certain level over the last couple of weeks and has now actually grown in, in China. But we're seeing changes we're seeing changes on a policy level with respect to cryptocurrencies in China, in Turkey, in India. We've even had um, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey talking about how dangerous cryptocurrencies are. Is this an inflection point for, um, for cryptocurrencies? Nice we have a central banker who warned about the uh, dangers of fiat currency. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't believe he's presiding, he, you know, he's presiding over a currency that's lost 99.5% of its value purchasing power. Um, and he's calling Bitcoin dangerous. <laughs> you know, the hypocrisy is, is ridiculous. And then Rishi Sunak's trying to brand the English um, uh, central bank digital currency, Bitcoin. <laughs> like, what? so Bitcoin's good, is it? So, <laughs> You know, so they're, they're, they're so hypocritical, and um, but the the I, I wouldn't worry too much about China. China's been making noises about banning Bitcoin since forever, and it, it, that's a, a a hydra that rears its heads every few months, and then it goes away again. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, the the you know, it's easy to say now in retrospect, but there was too much. There was an excess of bullish sentiment when Bitcoin went to sixty-four thousand dollars, and it's interesting that Bitcoin pulled back and the altcoins carried on going up because that's that's um, uh, typical behaviour that you see at long-term tops. Bitcoin did that in 2016, 2017. You know, Bitcoin peaked, I think, at the end of twenty sixteen, and the altcoins carried on going up for another month, and it's done something very similar just now. So. You know, maybe we're at the beginning of a crypto winter, but I think if you look over time, Bitcoin volatility is just, I mean, we just had a 50% correction, but I'm about to say that Bitcoin volatility is actually decreasing over time. Mm. So what was a 50% correction just now was, would have been a <laughs> an 80% correction, you know, three or four years ago. Um, I'm, I'm not too worried about Bitcoin in the long term. The big battle that Bitcoin's got in the short term is that the narrative that Bitcoin is somehow environmentally unfriendly because it consumes a lot of energy is gaining a lot of traction and it's it's making enemies among environmentalists. And we know that politicians and environmentalists are in the same, they're on the same side. Um, and Bitcoin is being badly misrepresented in these arguments, and it needs to make it needs to demonstrate that that actually Bitcoin is accelerating the adoption of renewable energies, which is is I think something like seventy five percent of Bitcoin mining comes from renewable energy already, and um, because Bitcoin is so energy intensive, it's accelerating the development of those, these renewable technologies and the efficiencies of them, and that's a story that really needs to be told. And to get out there, because otherwise Bitcoin's being badly misrepresented. Because what people are doing is they're taking the total amount of energy that Bitcoin requires and going, "Look, this is outrageous. We need to ban it." Um, but nobody, for example, is totting up all the energy that Google searches require, and then going, "We need to ban Google searches." And nobody's totting up, you know, all the energy that I don't know goes into. Uh, uh, tooth brushing and going, you know, we need to span brushing teeth because look at the combined energy that, you know, so it, it, no other industry faces that there's the same 
auditing processes that Bitcoin is facing. Um, but that aside, um, you know, if the, if the environmentalists come for Bitcoin, the green energy lobby, you, you know, they can do it a lot of term damage. There's a couple of people that have come to me wanting to buy Bitcoin and being interested, but being worried about doing it for environmental reasons. Mm -hmm. And to try and actually persuade them, it's not it's beneficial for the environment in that it improves the efficiency of energy consumption is a very hard argument to get across. Um, interestingly, the argument against Bitcoin is being made largely by, you know, the Financial Times, The Economist, the BBC, all the usual suspects who've hated Bitcoin since its inception uh, and, have, and have been wrong about it and have been proved wrong by the price. But nevertheless, they're now making this argument and, and, you know, unless Bitcoin sort of gets its, and Elon Musk now is, is articulating the same thing last week. Um, so unless, you know, Bitcoin's always been very good at getting its act together and making its arguments, but but there's a war of narratives being fought at the moment, which if Bitcoin's price is to continue appreciating, Bitcoin needs to win that 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 battle of ideas. And I suppose if we t we can't talk about Bitcoin, but I'm talking about kind of central bank digital coins, as you touched on with Bitcoin there. Uh, yeah, Chinese are really keen and working a pace to progress their central bank digital coin. Um, and you have to imagine that the U.S. aren't too far behind them. Um, is there a kind of um, a bashing of Bitcoin with a with with a view to replacing it with a, a Fed coin or a Chinese digital currency or a Brit coin, uh, and riding on the coattails of the success or the groundwork that's being put in by the the cryptocurrencies, the independent cryptocurrencies. Well, I think they'll struggle to to get rid of Bitcoin, and um, the evidence is in countries that have banned it, Bitcoin use has actually increased. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So uh, I, I wouldn't be too worried about that, but definitely we're going towards central bank digital currencies. That's a hundred percent. I think China's wants theirs unveiled in time for the Winter Olympics next year is is something I read, and um, you know, central bank digital currencies will bring into question a lot of the things that banks currently do. You know, if you've got your wallet with your with your money at the central bank, why do you why do you need a bank account anymore? And so that's one interesting dynamic that's going to come into play um all sorts of it it it's it, it, you're going to see the the role of behavioral economists come into play you know programmable money like if you think if you've got cash in your hand you can pretty much do what you like with it you can spend it on what you like but um if you've got central bank digital currencies there's all going to be all sorts of things programmed into the money that reduces the sovereignty of the person whose money it is so for example they can program in expiry dates let's say um you know they decide that that um you know the, there's a global pandemic and we need to spend a little more money to boost the economy or something where well, you just stick an expiry date on the, in the programming of the money and you force people to spend it you must spend um, it you must spend it in its entirety by a certain date rather yeah, than stuff it, it under the mattress I mean, and if you thought eroded inflation <laughs> eroded at the away of the value of your capital wait till you see what uh, <laughs> expiry <laughs> dates do and um and also it it opens up um uh, you know, your furlough money can be deposited in your central bank. And maybe, you know, if you're a bad citizen, you'll get a punitive uh, rate of interest charged against you on your let loans or a, a paltry paid of interest on the, on your deposits. And if you're a good citizen and you say the right things and you get a, and you have a better social credit score, then you get a, a more beneficial rate of interest. Um, you know, it opens up the doors to all those possibilities, which are quite Orwellian and quite, you know, like Aldous Huxley and not very savory. And in order to get central bank digital currencies implemented, they'll say, oh, no, we'll do none of those things. And then a crisis will come along. And then, of course, they'll start doing all of those things. So that's kind of inevitable. And thank goodness for cryptocurrencies, because they will provide much needed competition and uh, and uh, hopefully rein in the uh, the mission creep of central banks. It does sound all very kind of 1984, as you say. Um, and one of the points you make there in relation to central bank digital coins and, you know, if they're introduced and you have your crypto wallet for your Fed coin or your Britcoin, um, that you start to not require your, 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 uh, commercial bank, your retail bank. Um, it 
does kind of touch on the edge of things that you've spoken about before in relation to the Great Reset. And particularly, you start going down the idea of talking about social social scores and social status in relation to that. Um, is that is that how you view some of this? Well, I, I, I could describe a lot of the things that are going to happen and then somebody will put them all together and put it all under the banner of the Great Reset. I, I think the, the Great Reset... I don't entirely buy into those big conspiracy theories. I think they often happen more by accident than by design. But um, there's there's a lot of stuff that is going to happen because you can't stop technology. Technology makes things inevitable. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going to happen that um, somebody else could quite easily go, look, this is evidence of the Great Reset. Mm. So, uh, you know... Like I say, I, I think it's more by accident than design, but but somebody else could interpret it quite differently. Um, and I watched a video recently there where you talked about the clapback of the real world against um, against the tech world uh, and how we've seen such massive growth in tech in the tech world and tech stock and Silicon Valley over the um, over the last couple of decades and how it influences every aspect of our life. And that uh, in times like this, particularly if we see a little bit of a topping of the stock markets, that there might be a move in money towards more of real world um, real world stocks, as we call them, versus, uh, versus tech stocks. Would you talk to that for a moment? One of the things that we've seen in the uh, global economy since probably the 1980s and the invention of digital technology is this extraordinary growth in the digital economy. And What's made this growth, this was an economy that almost didn't exist before. You know, the internet never existed until, I can't remember what year it was invented, but let's say the early 1990s. And it's just a whole new economy that's just suddenly now there. And the growth potential of that economy, because of digital technology, is extraordinary. And it's because of the replicability of digital technology. So, for example, um, you know, in the old days, if I wanted to record a, 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 a tape, I'd put the record on and then I'd record the tape. And if I wanted to record two tapes, copies of that tape, I'd have to take the one tape out and then put another tape in and then take another. And, you know, if I wanted 24 hours well. of tape recordings, <laughs> it would take me 24 hours of real time to do it. Whereas now, I, you know, if I want to record a, send a song out to 24 people, I'd just send it out. Um you know, the instant replicability of digital has just brought this extraordinary rapidity and scalability to the digital economy. And so the digital, and, and as a result, it attracts investment quicker because investment, you know, if you look at a mine, it takes you 10 years to uh, to build a mine and before you start getting a return on it. And, you know, whereas digital, you might get a return on your investment within a year. And so it attracts more investment and that causes more growth and you've got this sort of virtuous cycle. Um, and so, you know, while the economy, digi- the physical economy has grown at, you know, two, three, four percent a year, the digital economy has grown at a f- far, far f- faster rate. And between the 80s and the 90s, digital eclipsed real. And then from 2000, the dot-com crash and the bottom of the bear market, bear marketing commodities, commodities and real stuff outperformed digital for maybe two or three years. And then the two grew at a similar rate from about 2003 through to about 2009. And then since 2009, digital growth has just eclipsed real growth. If you look at the money that's been made in tech stocks compared to the money that's been lost in mining stocks over the last 12 years, you know, there is your um, realization of what's gone on. But we do seem to have reached a point, I've just noticed it over the last three months, four months, where there's been a rotation out of digital into real stuff again. Suddenly, you know, the copper price is breaking out, the tin price is breaking out, oil has gone from minus 30 to 70, you know, um, that's a hundred dollar swing. It's not Mm. inconsiderable. Uh, um, And real stuff seems to be having its little time in the sun. Meanwhile, tech stocks have quietly been underperforming relative to everything else. And so I think we're going through one of those phases, it might last a couple of years or so, where real stuff does better than than digital. Um, you know, I could be wrong, of course, but that does seem to be a dynamic. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily, for example, that tech stocks are going to go down or that Bitcoin's going to go down. It just means that real stuff is going to do better. 
And I perform, and, yeah. And, you know, you look at something like gold versus Bitcoin. I'm a gold bug, long-time gold bug. I, I think gold is is an extraordinary, you know, it's the first metal that mankind used way before he discovered copper and smelting and everything else. He was wearing gold, you know, and he appreciated the value of gold. And gold has no use except to look beautiful <laughs> and to store wealth. And it is the most analog asset there is in a digital world. And I think that's just that simple um sentence explains why bitcoin has so dramatically outperformed gold over the last 10 years but as i say we're going into a bit of a rotation and the evidence of the last month is that you know gold's crept up from what 1650 16 just below 1700 through to we just kissed 1900 yesterday you know it's creeping up quietly nicely um and bitcoins whoa, 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 whoa. so maybe we're just going into one of those little periods where gold and silver have a little bit of time in the sun much deserved look we've been waiting a long time for it and similarly you know commodities as well so we've seen a bit of a rotation potentially out of a little bit um, of a rotation yeah in, into gold and silver and um, if you look at um the gold to bitcoin ratio hmm. it's done a wonderful saucer Yes. It's done one of those little saucer shapes, and you think, oh, that, that gold could do very well here. Okay. And and silver then in the same uh in the same breath. I mean, it's been uh stuck below thirty dollars for a good number of years now since its last uh, break above thirty dollars. Um that's discounting a very temporary break above thirty uh, over the over the first of uh, February weekend. But you see silver performing as well, uh, benefiting from a rotation out of uh, cryptocurrency to a degree because we're seeing um, we're seeing people who have been in cryptocurrency as their vehicle to help them protect against ongoing money printing. And you're seeing silver then as well as gold benefiting from a rotation out of that. Um, listen, I like silver. At one point, I thought silver, back in the noughties, I just thought silver was the most extraordinary opportunity that any of us have ever seen in our lives. If you combine the fact that it's got this plethora of industrial uses, it's almost mm. like a play on technological growth because everything we use from phones to computers to Lord knows what to to to. to the solar panels as well. You bring in the green technology there as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. It. You just got all these uses for silver and it's a monetary metal in an age of money printing. You know, you just thought, oh, silver, there's nothing can stop silver. It's just, <laughs> it's waiting to happen. And yet it's the metal that just disappoints. It's got all this, it's like, you know, this errant school child that's got all this potential and insists on not delivering on its potential the whole time. And so I've become a little bit um, cynical towards silver over the years because it's just let me down so many times. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, we do seem to be forming a, an, uh, this nice little sort of, I don't even know what it's called, some sort of wedgy thing just around about the $30 mark. There's a new technical analysis term, <laughs> a wedgy thing. <laughs> but, uh, and, it, and you know, there's a real kind of consolidation going on there and the lows, are, each low is a little bit higher than the last low, which is what you want to see. And meanwhile, it just can't seem to break through 30 but if you look at the long-term chart, once it gets through 30, you know, maybe a bit of resistance at 35, 37, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit at 45, but but not a lot. And there's a pretty clear run right through to 50. Mm. And so, you know, so, you know, what, what 30 to 50, what's that? It's only a, uh, maybe, a, I don't know, I don't even know what it is, 60, 70 percent gain. It's not that huge compared to something like bitcoin that seems to do that on a weekly basis but but the you know the silver miners will will do very well so you know i like silver here um and i have to say the chart action is similar in my opinion to what we saw in 2008 to 2009 where if you know it had a big run before the 2008 crash um and then it had the 2008 crash. And if you if you look at COVID as being our 
equivalent to the 2008 crash, the 2020 crash. Then it had a rally and it's sort of consolidating like it did late 2009, 2010. Then mm. it was consolidating around 20. Now it's consolidating around 30. And it did a sort of wedgy thing then as well. And um, and so it all looks, it, it looks pretty good to me, but, but beware, Silver, it will always let you down. Break your heart. So keep an eye. Keep an eye out for breaking the wedgie thing. I've got to say, I like silver. I own silver, and I've got a few silver miners. I've got a few silver bars. I don't have as much physical silver um, as I once did. I I, um, rotated it all into physical gold um, in around about 2011, I think it was. Uh, You know, when silver went up, had that big run, and then I never really bought bought back as much as I should have done. I'd become a cynic by then. Um, but yeah, I like, I like the look of it at the moment. Dominic Frisbee, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for being on Gold Court TV. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, you'll definitely enjoy this series of interviews with special guests like Jim Rogers and David Brady. And if you want to see more interviews with thought leaders and industry experts in financial markets, subscribe to Gold Court TV and hit the notification bell now.